Good evening. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get us started. I know our time is a bit limited um, this evening, and I know we have a great program um, lined up with the, for you with some videos and photography, so I want to make sure that we maximize our time together this evening. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Awista Ayub. I'm Deputy Director of the Fellows Program here at New America. Um, the Fellows Program brings on thinkers who are journalists, producers, practitioners, and scholars whose work enhances the public conversation about some of the most pressing issues of our day. Louis himself was a fellow with us a few years ago, and so we're, we're happy uh, to welcome him back again today um, to New America. Um, I know we also have quite a few journalists who have RSVP'd and are here in attendance, so just, if it's okay to just put a plug in, our application will go live mid-November. And so for those of you who are interested in applying to the Fellows Program, you know, feel free to talk to Louis about his experience as a fellow. And then please also log on to our website to sign up to receive an update whenever the application goes live later this fall. Um, so what, we'll go ahead and get started now that I got the Fellows Program taken care of. But um, today we're looking at the Afghan war. And the event tonight is a lens on the Afghan war. And we're very thrilled um, and delighted to have Finbar O'Reilly and Louis Palu here this evening. Turns out they're both friends from over 10 years ago, having met in Afghanistan, and so it's a bit of a reunion 10 years later, and it just so happens both their books out are out around the same time. Um, since the 1850s, photography has been a part of wartime media. Gripping conflict suddenly became visualized, and the public's accessibility to what was taking place in a war zone increased with every technological innovation. Louis Palu and Finbar O'Reilly continue this long-held tradition with the release of their respective photography books, Front Towards Enemy and Shooting Ghosts, that capture the experience of America's longest war in Afghanistan through various perspectives, both from the civilian and military side. Award-winning photographer Louis Palu was a fellow here in 2011 to 2012. Um, his accolades include a Guggenheim Fellowship, and his works have been featured in the New York Times, the BBC, the Smithsonian National Portrait, and, and the Smithsonian Portrait Gallery. Um, his latest book examines the five years he spent covering the war in Kandahar, Afghanistan. Front Towards en Enemy attempts to highlight the chaos of war and how media influences public perception. Finbar O'Reilly's work is a memoir co-written with retired U.S. Marine Corps Sergeant Thomas James Brennan, reflecting on the experiences of the war and the unlikely friendship they formed during this experience. O'Reilly is currently based in London, having spent 12 years in Central and West Africa as a photographer for Reuters, winning the 2006 World Press Photo of the Year Award, among many others. Um, to begin today's discussion, we do have two videos. Um, given the nature of their work, we did want to show their photography. Um, they both prepared videos. And just um, to give you a heads up, there is some graphic footage um, in both. So for those of you who might be very sensitive to that, just please be aware of that now. Um, and then lastly, please silent your phones. Um, we have a great conversation planned, um, and that's probably one of the one things that um, can ruin the mood. So if you can just silence your phones before we begin, that'd be lovely. Um, so Louis, I'll invite you to the stage. Um, each Louis and Finbar will both come up and just give you a summary of what the video will be that you'll see. Um, and then we'll be joined together, all three of us on stage at the end, um, and we'll take questions from there. Um, yep, get to the mic. So anyway, thank, it's really great being back in New America. It's like a little homecoming here. It's a fantastic organization. Um, I owe so much of my career trajectory right now to the teaching that was given to me and how to work as a journalist and thinker here. Um, lots of old friends in the crowd that I'm seeing here, and. Uh, really special for me to see all my old friends. And so the little video here, I've clipped like, it's about seven minutes from my film, Kandahar Journals. Anyone sensitive to gunfire, uh, there's gonna be a little audio. Just be aware, please. It's okay if you need to step outside of the room for that part. Um, I think it starts with that, but I, I wanted to also showcase the other complex layers of what a war looks like and sort of the complexities of, of what happens in a war and, and things you face sort of covering it. Um, so is Finbar gonna come up and, or just my video and then Finbar come up? Okay, cool. Do we wanna maybe turn these lights? Here.
يا 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 a very complicated place. Uh, the people here, I think they want to do well, but the Taliban influence is pretty strong. So a lot of times we'll go in, we'll talk to people, and you know they probably want to tell you more, but the fact that there's probably a brother or a cousin or a friend who's related with the insurgency usually stops them from, uh, from saying anything that might get them in trouble. The weirdest thing here is that is that there's no front lines, there's no friendly areas or even necessarily enemy areas because there's places you go into that people will speculate and say oh this is a guaranteed contact for sure we're going to get hit and then there's nothing <laughs> There's no easy way to define when trouble is coming or when trouble is not there at all. I'd say that's the most difficult part about this war. Uh, so far in, in almost a year here, I haven't, I haven't seen a single Taliban, but I'm pretty sure I've talked to a lot of them. Always far off. It's it's happening somewhere else, you know, or gunshots from a certain distance away from you and stuff like that, uh, or IDs place where the guy's not even around anymore, where he's been long gone. But you sit in these villages and you talk to like 10, 20 people. Well, there's a good chance that one of them is an insurgent or a sympathizer or has a brother who is and just doesn't want to tell you anything. There's probably a lot more rubbing elbows with the enemy than we even think we even know about. And they play on that whole mystique, the whole um, history of the Taliban, the actual Taliban itself here, right? So they, they can reap all the benefits, right, associated with that negative connotation of the Taliban, even when they're not really Taliban themselves. They're, they're drug runners, they're, you know, just power-hungry people, they're foreigners, they're this, they're that, and uh, they just call themselves Taliban, and, and it all just adds, it culminates, you know, and gives them this certain mystique, I think.
So let me explain why all the fighting happens around Kandahar City. So we have Kandahar City right here. This goes to Pakistan, this goes to the capital, Kabul, and this goes to Iran. But what we also have here is a number of very significant sites. What we have here is the holiest shrine in Islam in Afghanistan, if not the whole region. And what we have here is the tomb of the founder of Afghanistan. The Taliban was founded in a small village right there. Al-Qaeda had their headquarters here, Tarnak Farms, which is where they planned the attacks for 9-11. But I think the key thing to understanding the fighting is there are three agricultural districts west of the city. Argandab District, Zari District, Panjway District. And within these three districts, there are numerous small villages, and the Taliban use these villages as sanctuaries to threaten and attack Kandahar City. So, Finbar, if you'd like to come up and then frame your film as well. Sure. Um, so mine, mine's a little different. It's not a video. It's, uh, a video? it's an audio slideshow, basically a series of photographs that um, I took during my time embedded on two occasions with, um, with my co-author, Thomas Brennan, who was the leader of a, squall, a small squad of uh, 15 Marines at a remote combat outpost in Helmand province. And um, I think it's just a, a way to set the scene. There's some overlapping themes. Uh, that we would have picked up on in, in this film as well. Um, but let's have uh, a look at it and then we can, um, can have a conversation. It's about five minutes long. Dick Harez, Dick Harez, this is Coonjack. Are you copying the transmissions from the CP? I looked back and I saw the warhead. It was coming straight towards uh, Chun and I. I told Chun to get down. Uh, we both hit the deck. I don't remember the boom. All I remember is after the smoke had cleared, I saw Staff Sergeant Gonzalez running towards us, screaming my name. My name is uh, Thomas Brennan. I'm a sergeant in the United States Marine Corps. I'm with 1st Battalion, 8th Marines, Alpha Company, and I'm the squad leader for 3rd Platoon, 4th Squad. The objective was to push up approximately 4,000 meters to a target building to potentially ambush the Taliban. But we left Opie Kunjak at about 1,300. We pushed down into the city in a book. Once we got down there, we probably patrolled in about four or 500 meters, and that's when we t started taking pretty heavy volumes of fire. Hey, we're moving! What? They're moving! I'm moving! We wound up maneuvering on them. We made it about another 75 meters down the road where we hit an open field, and that's where we started taking AK and RPK fire. We set up shop inside a compound. We had the security out there. We had the AMP with the RPK, and we had, I had a saw gunner out there, and I had one of my team leaders out there with a 203 providing suppression. I had Lance Cobra Roche and Lance Cobalt War uh, moved to the next alleyway to uh, set up our next bounding position, and that's when they got hit with an RPG. 
we thought they stepped on a pressure plate and got blown up by an IED at first, uh, but then we seen them running back. They were pretty dazed. They, uh, they suffered grade two concussions. We had the corpsman set them inside the compound, take a look at the two of them, and that's when uh, myself and Lance Corporal Chun, we ran up to the same alleyway. That's when him and I got uh, knocked out by an RPG at the AMP shot. It hit the telephone pole right next to me. Him and I both suffered third grade concussions. My head really started hurting. Um, I started having trouble seeing. My eyes hurt like hell. I kind of sounded dumber than I used to be because words weren't making sense in my head. But uh, after about two days, my eyes started getting back to normal. I could start to focus, I'm trying to piece it all together, but it's all kind of blurry. My squad watched four people get hurt. My team leaders still kept doing their job. My junior Marines still kept doing their job. And even the guys that got hurt by the concussions, we were still trying to the best of our ability to do our job. I'm just really proud of my guys, and uh, I can't wait to get back to them and let them know. It's kind of hard to explain. We came together, family sticks together, and as long as I'm good to be out there, I want to be out there with them. We got a HESCO barricades as our primary means of defense to keep the enemy out. Uh, in our living quarters, uh, we have cami netting over the top. We paid $35 for a giant trash bag to uh, drape over the top of that. That way, you know, since it started to rain a little bit, it, it'll keep us somewhat dry. But for the most part, it's dusty. Uh, it's, getting, it's getting cold. We got the solar showers, but pretty much uh, we rely on baby wipes and clean socks. I showered once at Kunjak in the month I was there just because the water was too damn cold. Baby wipes get the job done. And we got cots and just whatever our family send us. I miss my wife and daughter. My, my wife sends me uh, photos of my daughter and she's just growing up and getting so smart without me being there. It's kind of scary leaving when she's two and getting home when she's almost three and you, you miss so much. Being afraid of where you're walking each day, that definitely takes a toll on you. The psychological aspect is tremendous here. Their placement of IEDs, they know exactly where you're going to take cover when they start shooting, so they put them there. Uh, so you got to be careful where you run to once you start getting shot at. They've got IEDs on the corners, they've got IEDs in the middle of the roads, and they're only going to strike you with an ambush if it's advantageous to them. You, you just got to trust your eyes and trust your sweeper up front with, with the uh, metal detector. Uh, one thing I always tell my guys is if, if today's the day, today's the day. I mean, we, we do everything we can. There's only so much you can do. Uh, the mission can't stop because you're nervous. you got to put one foot in front of the other and just keep going. Because if you don't, you'll be standing still, and that makes you an easy target. You can walk up and talk to a local national, and he seems like a straight-up guy. But then two days later, you could be detaining him because he was shooting at you. Where they don't wear uniforms, you can't tell the good guys from the bad guys until you catch them doing something guilty. That's got to be the most frustrating thing about it. Before, we couldn't make it 100 meters into the city without getting shot at. Uh, now we can make it five, six, seven hundred 700 meters into the city before we get shot at. So we know we're pushing them back. And I noticed when we went on a patrol that more people were starting to come back. I mean, it, it's a slow process. You know, every 500 meters we push them back, you know, that allows 100 meters worth of civilians to come back into the city. But if we can get them back to their homes, and that, then we can really start trying to make a difference by telling them, like, listen, we, you know, we pushed the Taliban back. You're back in your home. We're keeping you safe. You know, now help us out. The biggest accomplishments to myself are we found the IEDs that they've put out there for us. Nobody's been killed yet from, from the squad. And we've also killed Taliban. So in my opinion, on the squad level, that's winning the war. Bigger picture is a, a lot bigger than I am. I know I'm a piece of the puzzle, and you know, if we're not doing our job, then the rest of the puzzle can't fit together. My guys have to trust me, I need to trust my leaders. If I trust them and accomplish the mission they want done, then the bigger picture will fall into place. Thank you both for putting that video, both your videos together, and I think it's great as we begin the conversation to be able to have that um, in our minds and just to have that perspective from what you've both witnessed and experienced on the ground. Um, just to start off, I'd love to hear more about how each of you found your way into becoming a war photographer. I know it's not something maybe at the age of 10 that you necessarily decide that you want your career to be, but it'd be great to hear from both of you about what your journey was like into that. Um, into that field, but then also Afghanistan and how Afghanistan came into 
um, your work and what it's meant for each of you personally to have covered Afghanistan, you know, America's longest war so intimately? Well, for me, uh, it happened by accident. I was based in, in Central Africa for Reuters as a correspondent, actually, as a reporter writing um, about another huge sprawling conflict that was consuming um, a large part of Central Africa. And um, I started making pictures to go with my articles because I always knew that there was a better chance of them getting published and getting m more seen if I had photos. And little by little, I shifted into photography. And um, I had actually gone to Congo uh, the week of 9-11. And, um, and I decided to stay there rather than going to Afghanistan um, because I wanted to tell stories that there weren't um, sort of high on the news agenda at that time. But ultimately, I became interested in Afghanistan after I'd been covering conflict for a good six or seven years by then and had a certain level of experience, both with covering hostile environments, but also covering, um, uh, but also photography, um, which was pretty new to me initially when, when I was working in Congo. And um, it was the Canadian involvement, actually, that, that made me want to go to Afghanistan. Most of the focus when I first went there in 2006 and 2007 um, was still on Iraq at that time. But Canadians were the very front end, as you saw in Louis' uh, part of the, of the fighting force in Afghanistan. And as Canadians, we generally self-identify as a peacekeeping nation. One of our prime ministers created peacekeeping at the UN. And um, the fact that Canadians were fighting for the first time really since Korea was something I wanted to know about. And I knew as a newswire photographer, um, our clients in Canada would use those pictures, and they did. Uh, I think initially, I. It, it, I have a lot of the same story as, as Finbar is uh, Canada was going on a combat mission and I thought, wow, my country's going to war. We haven't been in a combat mission since Korea and I thought this is like this really important moment and uh, the, the, the focus was Iraq. And, uh, uh, but what I didn't realize after I'd made my film over the years is that sitting at my table, I come from a family of immigrants and Anyone who comes from a family of immigrants, especially from the generation of children whose parents were in the Second World War, my parents would always be like, hey, uh, clean your plate off, you're not leaving the table, because when I was a child, you know how poor we were? And I didn't realize until only a few years ago how important that that created my identity and how I identified with uh, parents who had suffered this trauma in the Second World War. It's very, very difficult to learn these stories when your father passes away that when he was four, German soldiers came into his house, pointed a gun at him and arrested his father because had relatives who were allegedly with the partisans and they would come into the house and search and do these kinds of things and realize that everybody somewhere has a connection to some kind of conflict in some kind and it's I think really important to understand your connection to present conflict. So that's kind of, I did that and then I, I went to cover the war and I got there in 2006 and uh, uh, I really, I'm like, wow, the Taliban are not defeated. Al Qaeda is not on the run. And I was at the Globe Mail at the time. I got back and I already started planning to quit my job and sell half my furniture and commit like what would be the next four years pretty much to covering the war. So that's what I did. I cashed in part of my retirement and I bought my own cameras. Did not tell my photo at the time. Uh, and then I just started covering it and I covered it as much as I could. Um, so for those who don't know, I am Afghan, um, and I'm from Kandahar. My family's from Kandahar. I was born in Kabul, but came here as a, a young child. And so during one of my first trips back to Afghanistan in 2006 as an adult, um, I was covering sports programs for girls in Afghanistan, and I heard about a boxing program for girls. So I, I went to the, to the gym, and I started to take photographs of the girls boxing. Um, and I distinctly remember one of the girls coming over to me and asking me where I was going to use her photos. And she said, you know, since 2001, photographers, journalists, they come here, they take our photos, they put them online. Sometimes you're making money off of the photos, or other times they're bringing in donations as a result of putting our photos on their website. And I remember that moment very distinctly, and I deleted the photos afterwards because I wanted to be mindful of making sure that I wasn't sensationalizing their story. Um, and I'm not saying that you were, but I guess there is an inherent tension oftentimes that you're in these war zones, and I know Finbar, you wrote about it pretty intimately in your book as well, is that there is this tension either from the civilian level or even from the military level that you're there to cover this story, but they, people, others might not want you to cover it the way you want to cover it. And I guess I'm curious to know 
how you handle that tension. Um, how did you feel sometimes covering something that was a very intimate moment in someone's life and even sometimes covering death? Um, and just how you handled those moments and those images? Well, for, yeah, certainly for me, um, when, I, when I first moved from writing into photography, I felt it was all part of telling the story and I would photograph various crises um, in Congo or Sudan or um, Chad or any number of places of where I was working. And initially, I definitely did feel like it was, um, that was my job. I was there to bear witness. I was there to take photographs. But the longer I did it, and the more times I returned, often to covering similar events, whether it's political violence or election violence, this kind of thing, um, there was this kind of repetitive nature to it. And I would go back to the same places and photograph the same scenes often over and over, and sometimes actually the same people. And at a certain point, I really did start to have a kind of moral and ethical um, dilemma about this idea that I exist on one side of the lens and in a way have a comfortable lifestyle, a career, a salary, a staff job, and the company that I work for is making money from the images that I produce and then they're making money from the, the clients and the clients who publish those pictures are also making money. And, and meanwhile, I'm photographing people who are still in the same situation and at a certain point it does begin to feel in some ways exploitative um, and that became a problem for me. Um, I haven't really found a solution to that, but the only thing that I could maybe say that I tried to do to assuage my own sense of guilt that comes with that would be to try to have just very human interactions with people because those are the things that um, they will remember, that you've come there to listen to their story. Everybody wants their story to be heard and if you do it in a sympathetic, empathetic way, often those encounters are more valuable to me as a person than the pictures may ultimately be as, as photographs. And um, probably all of us who've worked in these environments have become involved in some way or another with supporting local NGOs that do stuff. Um, and that's not something we generally talk about, but these are things that most photographers I know who work in these places would be involved in some way with local organizations who do things um, on the ground. Uh, I think we also, and in no way am I criticizing like being a wire photographer, because I think that all journalists, no, I, no, no it's okay. I can never shoot as fast as you all, but uh, or edit files fast. Um, but uh, the reason why, and this is in no way a criticism of the Globe Mail I was working for, I realized if I wanted to cover the war the way I thought I was seeing it, I had to quit my job and do it on my own. And I thought the, the opening quote in part of my book is it's Eugene Smith is resigning from Life Magazine because he feels like Life Magazine was changing the meaning of his story the way he saw it compared to how the editor said. And that's not, a villa, that's not me criticizing editors because I have a lot of great editors I work with. But I think it's a little bit about me saying this war is so complex, I cannot cover it on a daily news assignment all the time. I need to go there and spend a lot of time out. I can't be pressured to be filing all the time. A and this is something that we all struggle with because there is this, I hate calling it a machine because journalism is important. We wouldn't know about so many important things in the world if people weren't covering things. Um, and I, I raised whatever money I could and I would pay for my own trip and I would go out and shoot. And when I edited something that I thought was looking right, I would then approach publications and say, hey, if you want to publish this. So I kind of had a little bit of a reaction like you did, just doing the daily news coverage all the time. I thought, this is a really important piece of history and uh, I need to cover it in a way that when I get a phone call from an office, from a news organization, they're telling me what I'm supposed to be covering because that's the story, but they're in New York and I'm on the ground in a trench. And I'm like, that's not happening here actually. And that's not even an important thing. You have to understand what I'm seeing here. I need another two weeks. Like, this is very complex. Like, that video is a seven minute vignette of my five years from a 76 minute film. I can't tell you how many times people would go into villages and you want to make a change and there's just a thousand years of history you're trying to fix and we're trying to we all want it fixed in a few years and Afghanistan might be a weak state but it is a powerful nation that is much older than the United States or Canada and there's a lot of wisdom there but there are a lot of roadblocks to connecting the wisdom that we want to bring together to fix the country and so I really felt like it was really important and in terms of the exploiting definitely you know the reality is is cameras cost money trips cost money health insurance costs money the insurance for a journalist working there, if you get kidnapped or shot or hurt. I was really lucky, the military, when, you, when you, I worked unembedded as well. 
and embedded. I mean, there's so many complex layers. I know the military would take care of me, but if I'm out on my own, get kidnapped, ain't no one gonna come looking for me. And it's very, you know, the government might try and come and help me, but it is, there, there is a very expensive to operate there. And uh, what I ended up doing recently, because this is a big thing that I'm always conscious of, as you are and all, all my colleagues who work ethically, uh, was recently, I think I was approached by Jeep. I'm like, no way am I selling my photos for an ad. They wanted a photo of a US Marine. And my friend said, whoa, whoa, whoa. He said, you know, you could actually do something here. I don't believe photographs change any things. I think photographs help people understand things and then policymakers can be educated and go change things. I don't have that idealism uh, built into me for photography, but he said, look, it's Jeep. It's an ad. Uh, you can make a lot of money from this and you could, don't keep the money, donate it somewhere. And I thought, well, you know, this is, you know. I talked to the Marine, I talked to Jeep, and I made everyone in the ad agency agree to donate $100 to my cho our choice of a uh, charity. And so now I have two charities that whenever I have so much money from working, I have them on my website and I promote them. One is, uh, helps uh, Afghan women train teachers for Afghanistan, and one is for severely disabled veterans, uh, build mortgage-free homes for severely disabled re veterans. So I just feel like it's important to give back when I can. But even for, for photographers who cannot do all that, I still think it's important that if someone, people are dying or there are human rights violations going on, that there's someone has to show those policymakers where to sort of point their resources. And I still think that the reality is, is that a lot of soldiers and civilians are like, I understand what you do. Please do your thing. You know, I've had soldiers say, look, I'm not going to block you from doing this. Sometimes people are sensitive to that. And it's all a case-by-case -case basis, like with death. Like, sometimes I could take photographs. Sometimes I'm like, I'm not touching that. That's too, it's not going to work. Um, when I first met both of you, I mean, you both were showing me photos of your time in Afghanistan. You grew your beards out. I mean, I'm, I'm Af again, I'm Afghan, but I would have thought that you were from Kandahar um, if I was still living there. And so... Um, I'm curious to this idea of your own identity and being able to be embedded on various levels. One is actually being embedded with the military, but then also being able to blend in in a way that maybe someone who is blonde and blue-eyed can't, and what that experience is like in terms of being able to capture stories that others couldn't um, in, the work, in the line of work that you were doing and just how you may or may not have been able to take advantage of your own identity and, and your, even your features in terms of what you what you could do by blending in? Um, no, I think I gotta be honest, and the only reason to grow the beard is because you think it's cool at the time. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it doesn't really help. I mean, I'm, I'm embedded with the military, so I'm not um, gonna go and stroll around the streets. I have very, very strict, I work, as part of, I work there as part of a bigger organization, so I had my Afghan colleagues who would cover the civilian side of life in Afghanistan or the conflict, or they would get, they would source material from Taliban contacts for that side of the story. My role was very strictly within the military framework. So I wasn't fooling anybody really. It was, it was just, you know, like you wear your khaki clothes and all that kind of stuff. Um, it was like, uh, it's part of, it was just part of the thing. And I did know that if I was interacting with uh, Afghan forces, um, I might be afforded a little bit more respect than a clean shaven 18 um, year old soldier or Marine in that sense, just because of uh, the culture and, and the way that people interact there and the way respect is afforded to <laughs> men with beards, basically. Um, but I think it was, yeah, uh, anyway, Louis won the beard competition <laughs> in all of Kandahar for all journalists forever. <laughs> it was like down, it was about down to here. So. It's hard to imagine now, he looks so clean. He scrubs up well. So. Uh, I, 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 because I was there independently, it's what I always wanted, and I've been a journalist for 26 years, and I knew what I needed to do, and uh, I just wanted to be able to go out on my own. And uh, I don't know about my Italian heritage, what on the ancient roots from the Roman Empire into Asia, but when I grow a beard, it, I fit in very well. The, U.S. Special Forces called it my in with bin beard, <laughs> as in bin Laden. It was like a kind of bad joke. It was, I didn't make it. But they called, they called me bin Laden. Bin Laden. <laughs> yeah. um, but, but when I did, when you, when you go out, it's valuable when you can, and I did a lot, and I, I became well known for it, especially, say, 2009 and 10. And it's very, very dangerous, most importantly, for your fixer. 
because you will kidnap, they'll just execute your fixer, who's your local guide and translator. And we, we figured out a whole, because as soon as you pull the camera out, that's it. They know you're not local. They know, especially back in 2010. And I devised, we devised a, a, a something where I was, my friend Khan, I was his servant, and, I, and he would yell at me on the street, and I had a, a Russian little plastic camera that had a little panoramic lens that would shoot, and I'd have to focus it. And he would yell at me and uh, say stuff, and I would not speak. I pretend to be mute. So we'd go and check points and get searched. And uh, they would be like, why do you have this guy from the countryside with you? You're so well kept from Kandahar. Why are you hanging out with this, this guy from Zari and Panjwe? These, these are these farm districts out the city. Until they started roughing us up, and then I spoke English. And the Afghan police at checkpoints were like, who are you? And I used to pull out my media card that said NATO on it. And I said, general. <laughs> Undercover. That was the only way we used to get out of those checkpoints sometimes. But um, getting out into those, like, those homes and, and really I, I embedded with, Af and you did as well, Afghan soldiers as well, is ex all those different, there's a lot of criticism of the embedding program, but all of these points of entry are really important to understanding the war, especially for you back here home, because your neighbors, people, you go into a shopping, uh, uh, sorry, uh, like a convenience store, sometimes that cashier is a young man who probably was a Marine who did three tours. I know a Marine who's a cashier now. I have a friend who cleans pools who did two tours of Iraq and a tour of Afghanistan. These are all, and immigrants, I followed an Afghan family for 12 years. They escaped to Peshawar in Pakistan, they came to Canada, I've done three follow-up stories over 10 years. The highest selling Ford dealership in Manitoba and Winnipeg is run by one of the boys who was a, 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 re a refugee, who was Canada accepted refugee. These are all our citizens and our friends, so understanding all these different sides of the war is very, very important. Um, we have a good audience here tonight, so I'll just ask one last question before I open it up. But your titles of your, each of your books, can you just talk a little bit more about what that means, what it represents for, for your book? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, my book is, is very much the, about the American military experience. It doesn't focus so much on the Afghan experience of the war at all. Um, it's very narrow in its focus in this sense. But um, it, it's about the psychological and emotional costs of war for those who choose to engage with it rather than those who have it inflicted upon them. It's, I think it's an important distinction to make. So it's, uh, it's my friendship with this U.S. Marine who um, gets blown up on this ambush and suffers a, brain, a traumatic brain injury and um, post-traumatic stress and has to readjust when he returns home uh, into the kind of civilian roles that you're talking about. And he wanted to turn to writing uh, as a way of, of finding his way. Um, as he was ushered out of the Marine Corps. And so I, I mentored him into writing and he started doing a whole series of articles um, and went on to go to journalism school at Columbia and, and start his own news website covering the military. And this year broke the, the Marines United uh, story about the nude photo sharing scandal, uh, scandal in the military. So he's now doing great journalism himself. But the title Shooting Ghost is really, you know, these guys were out trying to fight the Taliban, and then you heard in both of our videos, the Taliban were this ghostly presence. You never really knew where they were. So it, it kind of refers to that. And as a photographer, I'm also shooting pictures. And, and the story talks about, um, the book talks a lot about um, things that I photograph, and friends of mine who work in this business who, who got injured on the job, who got killed on the job. Um, and so there are these parallels that kind of tie into it, the, the intertwined story of myself and my co-author. Actually, this was not the, my idea for the title. My publisher thought of this awesome title. I had a really not so good title. Um, what was your title? Uh, Fighting Season, which everybody's named three, 13 different photo essays after that. Um, it was just my go-to for a while. W when we designed this book, I just thought it was going to be really boring and useless to just like have a hardcover, a series of photos in our hardcover, because you could just do that on my website. And uh, when I was a fellow here, when I covered the Mexican drug war, what I understood, I, I was covering like 140 assassinations a month. Um, there are two camps that I started encountering every time the drug war came up. You only show bodies and drugs. That's all you do, man. That's you media. And then there's more to Mexico than that. And then there's our camp like, do you know how much killing is going on here? You guys don't show enough. And uh, there's a lot of injustice and a corrupt government here in Mexico. And you got to show that side. And I just thought it wasn't even about the war anymore. It was about these two camps that were fighting over what the narrative were. And I created this concept newspaper here at, at, at New America. 
and uh, you could re-edit the newspaper to what you thought the narrative is. And it was a really beyond more powerful way than I realized. I'd go into schools and I would get students to take the newspaper apart and had 16 photos and they could only show eight at a time because there were photos on each side. And so they started editing, photo editing. And I think it's really important. It's like, who looks at the byline of their photo when they read the news here? If you put your hand up. Because that's, that's who you know who took the photo. Like, if you don't know the source of your photos, you could be manipulated into doing things that you don't even believe in. And I think that when we talk about the rhetoric out there these days about fake news and uh, uh, alternate facts, I think we gotta be careful. When we look back at history, imagine if we start calling the Holocaust fake news. Because the photographers who photographed that, George Roger from Magnum and Margaret Burke White from Life Magazine, those are for me some of the most important war photographs of all time. And that is not fake news and that's not alternative facts. Uh, so when I created this book, I wanted to uh, make something that you could re-edit and that you, would make you work to read about the war. So I just thought of the history of, uh, I wanted it to be like a little like military dossier that got delivered to you. So th there's the slip case. You want to explain actually where Front Towards the Enemy comes from? Oh yeah, Front Towards the Enemy is written actually, the way it first came out is it's written on the front and you'll see it's in this set of cards. A Marine wrote it on the front of his helmet and actually it's written on the front of a, of a Claymore mine, which is a weapon that you have to aim in a direction when you may, may do an ambush. So it's like, so you aim it toward the enemy. And for me, a little bit of it is about, you know, the media can be used as a weapon against any enemy that whoever's wielding the photographs can turn into an enemy, so to speak. So um, I thought I'd make it a little bit of a history about all the different ways we see photographs. So um, you get a magazine, which is stapled, so you not, cannot change my edit. By the way, by the way, my two photo editors helped me on this. I'm going to shame them a little bit here. It's Sadie Corrier and Coley Coleman. They're right here. You can stand up. And just come on. Photo editors never get credit. <laughs> National Geographic and Washington Post. So um, I locked this, and there's a, a a great essay by Rebecca Semp from the Center of Creative Photography in here. Um, then I'm going to have to stand up. This is a little more interactive here. So you get a newspaper. Oops. You get a newspaper, kind of built on that Mexico concept where you gotta take it apart to see all the photos. You can re-edit the order of the pictures. You can remove all the NATO soldiers and just make it Afghans, or you can put all the NATO soldiers back in. You can change, how, you can do whatever you want with this. So there's that. Then there's these Marine cards. So these, so there's 10 of these. And there, there's captions, how many tours they did, where they're from on the back. Because I think it's important that we know their names and where they're from, what town they're from. So there's these. Um, now this whole thing, I'm gonna get to the last part, uh, can be hung in his exhibition because it comes apart, right? So we thought we'd give like an IKEA furniture guide of how to hang it as an exhibition. And I know- Does that mean, does that mean it's impossible to do? It, <laughs> it's gonna be impossible or someone's not gonna look at this. And there's gonna there, be three there screws help? left. Is it's probably gonna be a guy. Is there a, a helpline you can call? What? Is there a helpline you can call? Maybe, In just don't give me too much work. Yeah. But th there's like hammers and we ha I want it to be fun a little bit. Of course, if you want to put a nail through the book, that's your choice. But, but it can be hung as exhibition and I think um, one of the last parts is, I'm gonna need two volunteers to do this. Let's see. You have two people. Mom, Mom, yeah. it's just, and it's like a community event when you, okay, you can be look at this as, a, as like a book or you can pull it apart and it's 14 feet long. Okay, Molly, can you go over here? We're gonna just, we're gonna keep it horizontal first. Gina, Gina, perfect. Gina, Gina, wait, you're gonna, yeah, you're gonna, okay, there. And then, I mean, I, I just thought, we always see one photo, and no war is explained in one photo. So this is like a full photo essay that you can see all at once. If you wanna photograph it and post it, by all means, post all over the place. Um, but it's just, you know, a war is a lot more than one photograph, and I think this book, I want it to be something that pushes you to look at more photos and engage with more windows to what the war can look like or is. And I tried balancing it throughout the whole thing. Um, yeah, and the captions are on the back and there's these little dots where you can put magnets or clips, however you want to hang this. I already have like five invitations to exhibit this in places. Because then you can be the curator, right? Thanks, Gina. Um, then you can be the curator or the photo editor. I'm not replacing my photo editors. But it's, it's, there's a lot that goes on beyond the photographer that you need to learn about and photo editors are extremely important to that process. And I want you to understand how important it is, how good photo editors really 
change the way you show stuff. But uh, as I was working on this, I just thought. There's more? Yeah, there's one more thing. Um, so you basically you couldn't make up your mind. No, no, no. Wait, okay. Damn it, I need my phone here. No, no, no. I just thought, because then someone's like, oh, yeah, well, you don't have TV in there. I'm like, well, I can get you for that. So, so if you download a free QR code reader, there's this, like, anyone from the CD generation. I don't see anyone here who's just MP3 download. Maybe there's a few in the audience here. Um, but remember, there'd be, like, bonus hidden tracks. And I thought, so if you download a free QR code reader, you, uh, it, it doesn't say what it is, but it says to email me. But you can get Q, scan the QR code, and uh, you every month or two you'll get a short film from where I took all the photographs. Will be interviews like that you saw, and you can play like a short film festival on your phone. So you'll get new like well, I I I bought this Jack White album recently, and I put the needle on it. And the album was not playing. And I realized that he made the album for the album to play from the top to the bottom. And I thought, why can't print re-control the internet? So you get a book, and online multimedia pieces that we said is the future is now controlled by what is thousands year old technology. So you'll, every month or two, you'll get one of these. You got to email me to sign up for this, if you buy the book, by the way. The book will be available. I have a bunch out there. Yeah, yeah it's here tonight. They're just cleared customs. Actually, so anyway, sorry. That's that's it. So so our, our mutual friend said that if I'm doing a presentation with Louis, I'd have to really fight to get a word in edgewise. Um, so you get all the questions. Uh, yeah. So, so we'll make up that for was. Later. <laughs> sorry, I just wrote a book. That's it. <laughs> 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 um, so with that, we will shift to the Q and A. Um, if you could please also just state your name and your affiliation. It's helpful for both Louie and Tim Bar just to kind of have that um, just in, in terms of responding. And then please, I know there's a lot of you tonight, so just please be sure it's a question. Um, we'll have plenty of time afterwards if you want to have a conversation with either um, to, to really have that outside of these doors. But um, we'll start um, in the back there, and then you. Yeah. Uh, my name is Kami Bhatt um, with the Pakistani Spectator. Thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. My question is that you de uh, probably interacted with average Afghanis, uh, Afghanistan, uh, Afghani or Afghanistan people. Can you, d d can you tell me something that why many of those Afghan are unable to accept or appreciate American involvement uh, the, in, in an affair where America has given so many lives and America has spent like billion of dollars, but still they think that American as a foreigner rather than any somebody who is benefiting them, sending, you know, arranging schools, building infrastructures, building health structure. Why are lo most, many of those people unable to see these benefits for their society and they are still rejecting these American values, and they are fighting against it. Thanks. Yeah, please start. Okay. Um, I've met many Afghans at all spectrums, like government, the army, uh, civilians. And uh, I think it's recognized war is not a, you can't make a perfect plan. Uh, there have been mistakes made, and it's not just America. There are many, many countries involved in Afghanistan. Germany has, what, almost 5,000 troops there, 4,500 troops. Uh, Canada is still financially helping United, uh, Afghanistan, even though the military component's been removed. Uh, I, I have to say, being on the ground, I'm hard-pressed to have met many Afghans who said we want, although we're unhappy about a lot of stuff, we want you to just leave. I, I'm, I, I talk to my fixer quite frequently. He he's went to university in Quetta, and uh, he lives in Kandahar. Um, I, I have not met many Afghans who want all Western forces to leave, because I think they understand that just as if Western forces left Afghanistan, things would deteriorate, there are still US bases in Germany and in Korea from wars that are 50, 60 years old. So I think at some, on the sort of village level, they want them to get out of their small little area. But I think if you speak to most Afghans, I, I think there's very much an appreciation to a degree of how many lives have been lost, how much money's been spent there. There are frustrations, but there have been frustrations in all wars that are going on because it's not 
it's not a black and white plan that you can say, I'm going to do this and then it happens. So that's my experience and I'm just relaying from the people I've spoken to. You know, I mean, my interaction with Afghans was very limited because of the environment I was in. So I think rather than be repetitive, that was, that was a very good answer. Um, if it's okay, I'm just going to go outside of my moderator hat and, and respond if that's okay. Sure. But um, I think that's a very broad statement that I'm not, I mean, we're not going to get into back and forth conversation, but I'm not sure it's very valid. And so many Afghans very much appreciate American forces and, and, and just international forces being in the country. And when it was announced that troops would be withdrawn years ago, that was not always met with the most celebratory response either. And so I know that there's an, an intention for many Afghans to want a commitment from America specifically to be in there for the long term. And so I don't know if that statement is very valid. It might be in some places, but I don't think that's the majority viewpoint. And so I'm going to just respond and, and leave it at that. Yeah. You had a question? Hi, thank you for the pres presentation. Uh, pertaining to the moderator and Finbar particularly, the whole agitation around uh, the, the veracity of a photograph in a place like Afghanistan or, or Congo versus the written word, I'd love that you both speak to that. Is it also invasive to go in there and write about the, the boxers, for instance? Is there truth in what you say that's more valid perhaps than a photograph? Some thought on that. And then secondly, for both Louis and for Finbar, what's the end game in Afghanistan? I know it's an intractable question, but look into the future for us. What's going to happen in that part of the world? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll speak to um, the first part of the question, whether um, reporting and writing words about a specific story or situation, or if we're talking about the boxing club in Kabul, um, I, think, I think it's all in how you do it. it uh, as I was saying, it's, it's the interaction that you have with the people. I know that when I'm in a refugee camp in eastern Chad dealing with people who've crossed over from Darfur, that whatever pictures or story that I write about that family is not going to change their life at all. But I can have an interaction with them, I spend day with them, and, um, and a lot of times what I would find is that people would value the fact that somebody had come from far away to listen to what they had to say. Um, and whenever I could, it wouldn't be so possible in a place like that, but in, in parts of eastern Congo where I worked, I could go back into the, the bigger towns and I could get images printed um, in little photo kiosk places. And I would, if I had time, I would take them back to those places myself, uh, or I'd have my fixer do it if I didn't have time to get back to the same place. And in that way, you can feel like there's some kind of reciprocal um, feeling to these interactions. And sometimes I would go back, like I said, I would photograph the same people a couple of years later often and, and revisit the towns and the villages that I would go to. So uh, I can't really necessarily address whether writing about it is less exploitative than photographing it. I think it's all in how you approach any given place or situation or if it's a boxing club or a soccer team. Um, I think there has to be an understanding from your subjects uh, that things may not change because you're there, but you're there anyway to listen to their stories and to tell it. Um, I mean, I know for me, I changed names. I mean, I was very sensitive to being Afghan and writing about Afghanistan, and I had permission, but it was, I was also very sensitive to the stories I would actually share and write about, and there, were ten there was tension actually with my editor at various points in the writing process because they wanted something more sensational, and it was really hard for me to really be okay with that, even if I was an Afghan. I think just inherently I, I'd rather understand the stories and humanize the people rather than exploit it. And so I think every writer's different. Um, for me, that was just the, the framework that I worked within and that I was comfortable in. But changing names for me, I think photography, um, I think you want to do justice and, and honor the story, but I think with photography, you can't really change a, a face or an image. And so, or, or you can, but at least it's out there. And I think for writing, that was something that at least I had in my, you know, I was able to do. Um, and then do you guys want to answer the second part? I didn't get your name. I'm sorry. Oh, okay, great. Uh, I, I just want to say Jamie supported my work a lot when I was there. Uh, he's a really great guy and he's another photo editor that is a great ally to photographers. Any photographers in this room, room know how, how good he's been and I want to just acknowledge that. And sorry, what was the question again? Sorry, the, the second one. Endgame. Yeah, sec Endgame. 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 Oh. 
No, it's okay. I, I, I kind of like the challenge of being asked, and I mean this so totally affectionately. No, he's, got, he's got the answer. The policy like, question. It's all going to be fixed by 8 o'clock. No, 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 no. The policy answer to the journalist, but um, I mean, look, we're dealing with statues from the U.S. Civil War here right now. I mean, w wars have traumas that go on for decades, and I think that there are, I mean, I worked in the tribal regions of Pakistan. You cross the border into Afghanistan, and the people I was just with in Pakistan and the people I was just with in Afghanistan have been divided by a British map maker on the Durand line. Like, there's a lot of hundreds and thousands of years of history going on here. The area outside Kandahar City that I drew on that map, that was like, I don't know, some dystopian, Afghan dystopian story, which is twice as dystopian, about this Russian scorched earth campaign they did around Kandahar City to keep the, 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 the Mujahideen out in the 80s. So you almost got like, like five, six different wars that are going on in Afghanistan. Afghanistan is a huge drug war. Like 70% or more of the world's opium for heroin comes from Afghanistan. That's a war that is, and Matt talked about that, the soldier. Sometimes you think you're fighting the Taliban. They say they're a Taliban, but they're just drug cartels. It's, it's one of the world's biggest sort of drug producing regions. So you're going in there and there's like a thousand things everybody wants to fix and you're fighting a war against six different militant insurgent groups with six different leaders. And I think that the end game is, is to stay involved and stay managing the situation until, look, the Afghan army from 2006 to 2010 was like night and day, until something takes hold, I think. And that's, that's I think, what people have been doing in, in different parts of the world where there's still conflicts going on. But you worked in Africa, and I wondered what you'd share about that. Um, I mean, I think we kind of need to keep the conversation focused on, on Afghanistan, but I'd, I'd echo what you, what you have said in terms of long-term commitments, <laughs> I mean, from, from foreign partners, but from Afghans themselves and from, and from you know, the establishment of, of a viable um, political system that it's going to slowly weed out the people who are working to the detriment of the country and for self-enrichment. Um, but that's not an Afghan problem. I think we have the same problem in this country and many other countries. So these are, these are human flaws, these are human problems, and we'll always be grappling to come to terms with them. Um, two questions in the front, Miriam, and then you, and then. Thank you, it's good to see Awasta again after a long time. My name is Miriam Matash, I'm an Afghan-American attorney. I have my company, Prime Council, but I'm also a founding board member of Nuristan Foundation. We've done education programs in Afghanistan and rural areas. Um, I had a question for you related to, you know, telling the narrative. I did a TED Talk in Afghanistan about three years ago, and it was called Rebranding a Nation because Afghanistan has a negative brand now, and the people, the government, the country has to share the positive stories in order to rebrand what is truly happening. So first I'd like to ask each of you if there are three words that you can use to describe the Afghan people, what comes to mind? And second is, do you think that, I know you covered the war and there's a need for that, but do you think that journalists need to cover more of the positive stories so that people can get a balanced view of what's going on inside the country? To your last point, uh, absolutely. Um, one of the things that I tried to do uh, during my 12 years of working um, in various countries across Africa was, yes, as a newswire photographer, I had to go and cover the news events, um, but I would use those assignments to try and cover more nuanced aspects of life there and show a much more rounded picture of the places where I was working. Um, it was easier to do that in those places because I could move more freely. It's, it's difficult, as you heard from Louis, in terms of your own personal security moving around in a civilian environment, and that is still largely the case in vast swaths of the country. Um, I'll be going to Afghanistan in two weeks, um, which will be interesting for me because I haven't been back since 2011, so I will certainly be keeping my kind of antenna tuned to the kinds of stories that might um, apply along those lines. But yes, we need to cover uh, all aspects of any country or any story that we're, that we're documenting. Um, three words that I would use to describe Afghans um, who I met. Well, I didn't meet any Afghan women, so I would say bearded. Um, <laughs> Uh, no, but very hardy and proud um, and, and, and very serious. But uh, you know, I, would, oh, I was always struck by these hardcore warrior 
types that I met, and they'd be like keeping these tiny little dainty birds and kissing them and s whispering sweet nothings to these little, you know, these birds that they the would keep, birds. right? The minor birds, yeah. Um, so, you know, in some ways, that's part of this nuance of, of the, the, the places that you um, and the people that you meet along the way. So, I, I spent a lot of time with the Afghan army, like a lot of time. Uh, they usually had a, a base connected to the Canadian base I was on, and I ate there every day. So, strong, I'm going to go backwards from the way you answered. Strong, funny, and sorry, it's two words, good food. That's, <laughs> I mean, I remember we were about to go on, a, on an assault somewhere, and, and this is, you know, I think about war. War is also about humanity, not just inhumanity. And it's just, we were about to, we're getting ready, and they're peeling potatoes. And this soldier just pulled a flute out of his body armor and started playing a flute. It's in the book. And I'm just like, where, where did this come from? Or there's a photo, too, where there's a police officer who's wounded, and he has two pet minor birds, and he's singing to them. And th those, are, those are the stories. That's what spending months and years co covering that side of the country can turn out as photographs. I never think of positive or negative, because that for me is more of a public relations view. No, I mean, I mean that in a friendly way. I look at it as it's all reality, it's all there, and I try and give as much diversity as possible. And that's why I kind of designed the book like you can pull things out. If you don't want to see US troops, you can pull them out of the book if you want. Also, when I say Afghanistan, it's kind of like, it's like United States. Like, a farm in Oklahoma to New York City, that's like two different countries. It's like people say I have a Canada, Canadian accent. Anyone who's Canadian gets the about joke. But a third of Canada is French. So there is no a or a boot. That it's French. It's Quebecois. And if you talk to someone in Yellowknife, or if you speak in Nuktuktut, you go up to, say, you know, Baffin Island, th there is, like, there's just Canada is a thousand different things. This is America. It's in Afghanistan, like, from Ghazni to Kandahar to Helmand. I mean, the, especially Afghanistan, the amount of invasions that have gone through there, especially Kandahar. I mean, there's always a story about something being burned down or destroyed by eight different emperors. And I always think of Afghanistan being many things. And I always think of everything I cover about it's important to show as many different layers of things. That's the way I look at it. But that is a very important question and uh, a, a very important way to start looking at any country that has a conflict going on in it. I'll just quickly answer Jay, since you asked me also, but my three words would be resilient, um, hospitable, and grateful. Um, and I think, I think I, sh I share the same concerns you do in terms of just with this current media cycle, how any story, any positive story from any country can be covered in the news today. And I don't really know, I'm not a journalist, a working journalist, and I think that's really for journalists to maybe kind of be more reflective in terms of their own work and how they can get that out there. But, I mean, I've spoken to authors where they can't get booked on TV anymore because there's so much breaking news that's happening on a daily basis that they can't get pre-booked out when their book is about to come out. Um, so I just, I think that's a pretty um, interesting reflection on just what the media industry has become. Um, so hopefully there is maybe some thoughtful um, inward thinking moving forward, so thank you. Um, I want to be mindful of time, and I did see quite a few hands, so I'll take two questions at a time, and then you can either choose to answer both or, or one. I saw your hand up a while ago. Can you just wait for the mic, and then I'll go to you. Yeah. Hey, Laura, this is for you. How do you come home after this? So seeing your pictures, I don't know what the time frame is, but it was a pretty intense scene. Seven days later, are you in London or New York? And then how do you transition that? Yeah, um, I mean, and then I'll just take a oh, second. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Um, down in the middle. Um, mine is kind of playing off that, actually. Uh, how did your experiences covering Afghanistan impact your future coverage of events? Or did it? Hmm. Um, so, yeah. How, uh, yeah, so I would come back, f uh, I would usually spend a month or two. You s between six and eight weeks normally I would spend at a time in Afghanistan. Louis would spend much longer there, um, but my stints were usually six to eight weeks, and I would do it twice a year on average. And it would be very strange, because I would leave from that combat outpost uh, on a truck, uh, drive to another base about two hours away, wait for a helicopter, and maybe within 24 hours I'd be in a $600 a night five-star hotel in Dubai on my way back to London or Paris or wherever. Um, and it was always a very strange dissociative kind of experience. Um, 
And that was the case probably more so from Afghanistan than most other places because when I was covering Congo, I lived there uh, for two years and same with Rwanda and a lot of these other places. Or I would be returning to my base in West Africa in, in Senegal. Um, so those are quite different experiences. And um, well, I mean, the, the short answer is I would, I would try and go and spend time with uh, fat friends or, or family. Um, but the longer answer is you write a book um, and try to make sense of it all and what it means and how you kind of redefine yourself. Because I stopped doing this at a certain point, this kind of work. And, um, and it's, it's a question then of how do you, uh, once you become identified or self-identify as a photographer who does this work, it's hard to leave it behind. And how do, you, how do you recreate a new identity for yourself away from the front lines and the battlefields and, and that kind of thing? And it can be done, but it's, 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 it's challenging. It takes time. It's taken me the two years of writing this book to, to feel fully removed from it now and, and comfortable moving in a, in a different direction that involves writing as well as photography. And yeah, it, I suppose it did change um, the way that I worked in um, ways that are, we can maybe have a longer conversation about afterwards, yeah. Yeah, for me, the way it changed me is I was there like at seven or eight months at a time, and I realized that, you know, you're so, you're pushing so hard, like, you come back, you're still there, you're pushing so hard to get all this done, and you have a photographic goal, and career goal, that you don't realize if something happens to you that your family is impacted. And I just started having this nightmare in 2010 that my mother was gonna get that phone call. And that's when I started realizing that covering that very front line kind of tip of the spear stuff was not the way I wanted to cover wars anymore and I was gonna step back and let other people who were doing that do it for me, so. Um, yes, there and then we'll hop over to there. So we'll take two and questions at a time. Mary Beth as well in the order. And then Mary Beth. Hi, my name is Wajid. <coughs> I am from Karachi, um, but I work here in DC. So I have met several refugees coming from Afghanistan. Um, so with the course of events, you have met several refugees. We don't talk about IDPs who are affected by the war, not necessarily at right, right there. You don't capture them, but have you seen their struggles? And this is same. This is the same theme in Syria. This is the same theme in Rohingya, Afghanistan, Chad, for example. So how do you humanize that element? Or I would say, have you ever uh, done a story, pictures, on how the IDPs and refugees are impacted? Which are usually not, they're not sensationalization items. So they're not really covered in a day-to-day, -day, but this is a like 10, 15 year journey. When, like you mentioned, there are family who moved from Canada to Canada from Afghanistan. It's a long process. Thank you. And then um, you're Mary Beth over here. Yeah. I'll get everyone's questions if you want to. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so I work at the Washington Post um, on the. Um, I, I'm an editor there with on the word side, um, but I'm, I'm just curious about the frame or the lens that you guys use when you think about the value of your work or the um, ethical part of your work. And I can totally see where it's really frustrating, where you can feel very powerless when you see all the suffering and violence over a long period of time. But um, is the right frame um, that it's only valid if you went managed to change a family's life or like end the war in Afghanistan? I mean, isn't there another um, level that you can look at? I mean, ex exposing people in, in other parts of the world? I mean, would it be better if we didn't send war photographers to these crisis zones? No, we were talking about this earlier on. So yeah, I think we still need to document these things, um, of course. And I think, as Louis said, the idea that one, it's a very rare picture that's gonna really change the course of, 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 a, of a war or of history or even a family's life. Um, but what is important is to keep that flow of information going um, so that so that people do kind of see what's happening from an independent perspective because we've got all this information that's out there now, user-generated content, all the various sides fighting in conflicts in Syria. We, it's not like we don't know that there's a chemical attack in Syria anymore. Um, but all of that information is that. It's information, it's not journalism. Parsing through all that 
that stuff that gets put out on social media by the various parties in any conflict um, is, is different from, from sending in you know, a reputable or professional photographer from a, you know, a serious news outlet. I think sort of what we talk about a little bit is that we reached the point where we felt um, pretty exhausted emotionally from, from having done this for <coughs> extended periods of time. So we started, I, I mean, I don't want to speak for Louis, but certainly I felt like, although this stuff needs to be covered still, I'm not going to be the one to do it anymore. And you talked about letting the next generation come along and do it. Um, so I certainly now focus m a lot of my efforts on speaking with younger journalists and talking with them. And, and you know, I'm never going to tell somebody to not go and do this because they won't listen to me. And I wouldn't have listened if I was the younger journalist. Um, but what I can offer are some caveats and some thoughts on how they might want to think about things and, and look after themselves and look after their colleagues and also the people who they're photographing too. Um, I'm going to start making notes because they're the, the double questions. <coughs> IDPs, um, what was really unique to the area that I covered was the amount of combat that was there. I think it was like every day or every second day it was like a maneuver to contact. All it was like hold them out of the city. And I have to say that, um, to your point, and talk about IDPs in the same sort of moment, I think by, by 2007 or 8, I think there were, there were public affairs officers saying, Louis, do you please want to come cover? Because like, we have no journalists coming here anymore. It was permanently staffed, and now it wasn't, and everybody's covering Iraq. I remember in 2008, I think I covered a firefight every day for three months. It was like a daily, daily combat every single day. And I, I saw hardly any journalists come to that area anymore, and a lot of times it was, it was kind of sad. Like there's no U.S. troops here, so we're not covering it. Or they would come out for a day or two and they would leave, and I would stay on the front line. It was like I would have to embed because the area was so violent. I could only get out there to the civilians if I went with the military, and I I do think it's super important. Um, also, it's personal even more, and it's tragedy that tragic. It's more personal now because. People like David Gilkey died doing this, and he was a really close man. He was like a big brother to me a little bit. And uh, there's a few others. Sorry. Uh, and it, it is worth it. It's, uh, it it's, it's important that we know about all these things going on in the world. And, and when it comes to IDPs, there's so much fighting. The IDPs were like from village to village. They were like, uh, there's shelling going on right now, so we've come to your base, please. We can't be there. Or they just hung two guys in our village, and we're scared, and we don't know what to do. And the IDPs in that area around Kandar City, those districts, uh, it, it was like kind of on a daily basis, depend they, depending on where the shelling was, there was an airstrike, or, or there was a lot of new Taliban in the area. So um, it's definitely something you try to cover. Unfortunately, in that that area is extremely violent. That area outside Kandahar City is also controlled by a lot of drug cartels, especially in Helmand. And it is almost impossible to get out and cover it sometimes. So I think kind of talking about those two things, the UNHCR, for anyone else in this room, is a great resource to study sort of the movements of people. Uh, and the, the Committee to Protect Journalists, uh, which right now, if we look at journalists in trouble, please look at Mexico. I put a little plug in there for what's going on in Mexico. Uh, there's a lot of people being killed there trying to cover the news. So uh, I, I do, I think we downplayed a little bit. And I think to your point, it's true. It's really, really important to talk about that. Yeah. And then um, the woman in front of you. Yeah. Hi, my name is Lauren. Thank you so much. This has been really interesting. Um, I was wondering, Louis, you mentioned that you did made a decision to not be embedded. And I'm curious what, why you chose that and how being embedded affected your imagery. And just very open-ended, if mm -hmm. the policies required to become embedded had any effect on it. Um, and then we'll take another question. Um, hi, my name is Madeline Cook. I'm a student. Um, and I just wanted to ask, what would you say to journalists that want to go to these conflict zones and tell these stories? but are also aware of the oversaturation of media and some freelancers who might come for the wrong reasons and how you respond to that. I'm thinking a few months ago, um, a freelancer released all of his photos because he was angry that people weren't buying them and it really undermined the, the journalists that were there and just how to respond to that as an upcoming journalist. I'll take care of the embedding question, not embedding. Um, I just wrote a, a paper for a, 
it was actually painful, five, 5,500 words. I had no idea how painful your job is when you do the writing there. I, I had a twitch in my eye when I was done, and it was, uh, it was for an academic public journal, actually, on kind of how ISIS and Al-Qaeda make their own videos and photos right now and populate the visual sphere. But what I also talked about is the embedding program. And people need to understand that embedding in Iraq and embedding Afghanistan are two, the rules are sometimes similar, sometimes different. A rule that was in in 2007 is different in 2010. Uh, I took photographs. A lot of times I did not write anything that would get inflame things. I did not take any photographs that once in a while people would be like, hey, we we're, not, we're not happy with this photograph. Um, the embedding rules from the British to the Canadians, to the Americans, there's some fundamental simil similarities, but there's a lot of differences as well. The British were the most strict, actually, and gave the, the least access for me, actually. Uh, Americans, from the Marines to the Army, from the 82nd Airborne to the 101st Airborne, I mean, these are different interpretations, depending on who your public affairs officer was. Um, I did medevac, and there was no control whatsoever. The, the only rule, and I had no problem ex respecting it, was that if someone was killed or seriously wounded, that they were, you would wait for them to notify their next of kin first, like their family, which I'd have no problem with that. And then sometimes the photos were so graphic, I couldn't, they were just really bad. I, there's moments where guys are just so badly wounded, I wasn't even, I couldn't even, I couldn't even show that. I couldn't even take photos of them, actually, just for my own ethics. Um, and uh, I think there were times where you want to go somewhere and go do something, and there was someone saying, no, you can't go do this, or oh, you can't do that. But, for me, in my, everybody's got a different experience. For me, it was the basic rules was, I don't want to get anyone killed, so don't show anything that's going to get someone killed. Like, don't go on Facebook and say we're going on a secret attack tomorrow. Uh, someone did that. That was... Uh, uh, that wasn't me. That wasn't you. Okay. Um, th there was a TV cameraman. They were, they were actually about to attack what was the birthplace of the Taliban. And a TV cameraman, in the dark, turned his light on on his TV camera and started filming the troops about to launch the attack. Which, well, yes, so you start seeing, you know, uh, and uh, don't release sensitive stuff. Uh, secret radar antennas. Uh, those don't, were never in my photographs anyway. You have secret radar antennas? N no, the military okay. does. Oh, okay. Um, anyway, but I, I, just, uh, I, I just did it, the embedding and unbedding, because you just, lots of different ways of seeing it. So I, I, one, I'll leave, the, if you want to respond. Yeah, so um, Madeline, right? Yeah. So for students who want to go and do this kind of work, you really need to understand what the story is, why you're going there, and assess your motives. Um, is it to tell a story? Is it to advance your career? Is it a combination of those things? Is it ego? Um, and I think you really need to feel a genuine interest in that story that you'll be covering and be willing to invest time and effort and most likely a lot of money of your own before you see any results. That was certainly the case when I decided to move to Central Africa and base myself out of Congo for a couple of years. And then the important thing is that you're going to have to develop your own voice. That might take a little while. Uh, I think the challenge that that photographer who released his pictures may have been facing is the fact that the images he had to offer weren't any different from any other number of photographers who were producing images from there. And so um, that's not to come down on him, but it, it just highlights the fact that it's no longer enough just to be there anymore because these pictures are out. All, all kinds, of, all sides, as I was saying before, are releasing stuff on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook. There's imagery of pretty much everywhere now. So as a photographer or as a, a writer who's telling stories, you're going to have to find a way of telling these stories that's unique to you. That's what you're going to bring to this game. Um, and, f and really just find, find a voice that's distinct and a way of telling stories that will separate you from all those other people who are doing it. And that's not easy and it'll take time, but, but that's what you're gonna have to do in this saturated market that, that exists today. So we are right on time. Um, and it's, you know, um, we're very grateful for having you both here today. I think your final words um, were, really, were really great and right on point very much to the work that you both have been putting out into the world from Afghanistan for several years. Um, we do have copies of Front Towards Enemy and Shooting Ghosts available for sale, and they'll both um, be here to sign for a bit um, before, before you leave this evening. So please pick up a copy. They're both great books. Um, as you saw, Louis' book is very interactive, so you can get a good workout in terms of being able to assemble it and, and put it together. So thank you both for coming and, and for sharing your perspective on it. <laughs>